talk a little bit about geology and the connection to pots and rocks and things that we use. So I'm going to divide the talk into three parts. We're going to talk about the history of the Earth, a little bit just kind of in general terms, um, the origin of the materials that we use for pottery, how they, how they originate in, by geological processes. And then lastly, if we have enough time, um, I want to talk a little bit about the local geology here, what happened here geologically in the past, because this is a really fascinating area for geology. A lot happened here. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. So the origin of some of the raw materials we use for, for pottery. Clays, and now I'm not talking about clay bodies. When, we, when we're working with clay, we, we use the term clay really loosely. But when we say clay in the studio, we're actually working with what's called a clay body. And that's a preparation. Usually it's a mixture of several kinds of clays, plus a flux, plus some silica, plus maybe some other stuff. I'm talking about natural clays the way they would be found in the ground. So the, the, the clays that are used as materials to make a clay body were all formed from pre-existing rocks and minerals. And they're usually, they're either formed on the surface of the ground by weathering, by the, nat the same weathering process we talk about, the water and the, and the, air, the acid rain, and, it, and the, minerals, the minerals sort of decompose and they break down and change. Or they could be formed deep in the earth because there are, there are natural solutions and water that's percolating through the ground. Some of it's pretty hot if we're near like a volcano or something. And those hot solutions that are percolating through the ground all the time under our feet are cha also changing the rocks when they pass through them. So basically, the clays are kind of what's left over from another rock. So the, the, main, the main clay mineral, the main clay we use, kaolin, is primarily formed from granite. That, rock, that, that piece of granite I passed around earlier, the feldspar in the granite is what basically changes to clay, to kaolin clay. I'll pass this around too. Here's a big chunk of feldspar, so you can see a bigger piece of what the feldspar is. This is a, it happens to be pink instead of gray, and it's a, little, it's a different kind. There's a little bit of another mineral here, mica. You'll see the shiny stuff. Now, mica is another mineral. If mica is broken down, mica changes to another clay mineral called illite. So almost all the clay minerals, the clays that we find, are composed of these two clay minerals, kaolinite and illite, and they're formed from this stuff. And what happens is, these, these, the feldspars contain elements like, like what we think of as flux elements, like sodium and potassium, and if you can dissolve those out of the rock over a long period of time, what you'll end up with is, or what you're left with is clay. So if I take that stuff and remove the fluxes from it, I end up with clay. So the both of those minerals there would turn, would turn into clay. The feldspar would turn into kaolinite, and the, the mica would turn into illite, which is another kind of clay. Volcanic ash, now here we talked about before. Volcan we actually, you've probably seen it, we use volcanic ash as a glaze ingredient. It's called pumice, it's another name for the same thing. That's just plain volcanic ash. You go collect it, like from Mount St. Helens, and you can use that as a glazing agent. Well, volcanic ash is essentially identical to obsidian. It just happens to be in a, in a naturally occurring fine dust form rather than in big chunks. So this is what happens when, instead of the volcano just oozing out and kind of burping out this liquid, you know, this liquid lava, it explodes and blasts it all over. And when it blasts, it blasts it into tiny little bits up into the air that cool and rain down as ash. Basically the same composition as that. So I could grind up that obsidian, which I never would sell, but I could, I could, I could grind it up and use that as, my, as a graze ingredient instead of pumice, because it's essentially the same composition. Okay? Now the, the clays are, their clays can be found in sort of two different general locations. They can either be found more or less where they were formed, or they might be transported and moved somewhere else and then redeposited. And those are the two kind of clay, two categories when we talk about natural clays, primary and secondary. Primary clays are clays that are pretty much found in the same place where they were formed. So, and this had, so, which means, so for example, um, you've all heard of Grolic, probably Grolic Kaolin, which is the British Kaolin. Grolic Kaolin formed underground 
from a big chunk of granite, that was a granite-like rock that was there millions of years ago, and solutions passing through the ground dissolved away all the fluxes and turned this big mass of granite into a lot of clay. So the, the, the neat thing about this is, so it didn't get moved around. If the granite had a very limited number of minerals in it, after it was changed, it didn't pick up a lot of impurities. This is why growling kale and, and primary clays in general are considered fairly pure, because they don't get moved around, they don't get contaminated. So this is why grawly kaolin is, is gives you this nice white clay for porcelain things, because it didn't get it didn't get moved around or transported or contaminated. It's just what was left from the granite. Now in the granite, remember I had three different minerals. I had quartz, feldspar, and mica. Well the mica turned into a kind of into mineral, into clay. The feldspar turned into clay, and all I had left was quartz. Well, there is a lot of quartz. Any kind of naturally occurring clay you find, there's always a lot of quartz in it, because nothing happens to the quartz. Quartz is basically indestructible. It just sits there and looks at you. So while the feldspar is changing into clay, the quartz is just sitting there and you know, waiting its time. And so you dig up the clay, and now you've got what we call clay, but it also has a lot of quartz in it. So there's a case where that could turn right into a nice white-looking clay. And that's what happened with Grawley. And that's what also happened in Georgia. There's a lot of kale in Georgia. The same thing happened. There were granite-like rocks down there that changed into grit. So those are primary clays. Now, if the, if the clay, if, if this lump of clay either formed at the surface or was formed at depth and then got brought up to the surface by erosion and, and the rocks rose in the crust and then, it was, and then it got eroded and carried away by streams and rivers and then deposited somewhere else, those are secondary clays. So the clays got transported by, let's say, the, mostly water streams, and so they had a chance to pick up a lot of contamination, dead frogs, leaves, sticks, pollen, you name it, other, other minerals in the stream bed. So, they, so they're not, they're, as, a, as a whole class, they're not as pure as primary clays. And these include, so these include things like ball clay, stoneware clays, fire clay, earthenware. These are all naturally occurring kinds of <coughs> secondary clays, and they all tend to be to be somewhat impure. So the secondary clays, depending on the rock that they started from and depending on what happened to them and depending on how they were transported, can either be really, really dirty and impure or not so bad. And this is what, and the, and the other thing that happens when they're transported is the clay particles can get ground up. If you can imagine clay particles being transported by a stream and there are rocks and boulders and everything there, the rubbing together of the rocks and the sand particles grinds up the clay, because the clay is fairly soft mineral, it's not particularly hard. So it gets ground up. So, so a lot of, of secondary clays also tend to be finer, finer particle size, which means for us, they're more plastic. Ball clay is probably the most plastic clay, kind of naturally clay that you can get. You can't make things out of ball clay. It's so plastic that it shrinks a lot, it holds a lot of water, but it's an ingredient in most clay bodies. You put it in a clay body to make, if you have clays that aren't plastic, you'd add some ball clay to make them more plastic. And ball clay is a good example of, of being beaten to death by the transportation process because it gets, it gets ground up so much. And we'll, get, we'll talk a little bit more about those. So, but I say, so the clay properties really depend on the specific kind of clays. What was the rock that it came from? What were the weathering processes? What actually changed it into a clay? And how was it transported? Was it transported by wind? Was it transported by water? How far did they get moved? Does it, was it moved just a short way? For instance, EPK, Edgar Plastic Kaolin, this is actually a secondary kaolin in Florida. Well, it originally came from somewhere around Georgia, roughly. So it's not that contaminated. It's not as pure as growling because it is a secondary clay. It got moved, but it's a little finer and a little more plastic than growling because it got moved. And it's a little more contaminated, but still not too bad. Um, so, I, I mean, so, yeah, so EPK is the secondary one. Ball clay is, is very fine. And common red earthenware, like the stuff you think when you, like you find red clay in your garden or you find clay that's maybe gray or brown, but when you fire it, it turns red, has a lot of iron in it. That's, that was probably formed from a rock that had a lot of iron to begin with. And it was also transported, so it ends up having a lot of fluxes in it, a lot of impurities, which is why it melts at a low temperature. That's why it is earthenware. Not because it has different clay minerals in it, but because it has all this other stuff in it that act as fluxes and make it melt at a low temperature. And here's a good example of how of sort of the weathering process. This is a kind of metamorphic rock that I collected down around Washington, D.C. And I had to dig. This is probably pretty fresh rock. And this rock is probably, you know, I'm going to say, yeah, 350 million years old, roughly. Um, 
But I, I, I was able to find other locations that had been exposed at a, for a long time. This is the same rock. And this is the same rock that's well on its way to, to changing into clay. So this was protected. This was buried deep inside of the rock. This was exposed. And you, you, you feel the difference. This one feels a little, little lighter weight. And actually, I had to soak this in, in um, shellac about 10 times because it would, I, could just, I could almost just crumble it in my hand. Well, I wanted to be able to use it as a display piece. So it feels, if it feels a little soapy, that's because it's covered with, it's, it's impregnated with shellac. But this is the same rock. And if you notice, this is starting to look like red clay. Well, it is. Basically, this, was, this, was, this has a lot of red clay in it and was formed from this rock. And this is just, this was in one location and I was able to find a spot where high up where the rock had been exposed for ages, it was turning into this and it was just falling apart. This is the fresh rock, still really hard. Same rock. So that's well on its way to becoming red earthenware clay, natural red earthenware. You feel like the other one's heavier too? Yeah. Okay, so just so some so some of the other materials we use, just I just mentioned about the clays. Well we use silica as a glaze ingredient, right? Well here's a chunk of here's a chunk of, of, of quartz. I collected this up on, on Gambrel State Park. There's a ton of this stuff there up on there on the mountain. Um, and this is just a massive chunk of quartz. Now the quartz that we use for our when we use quartz or silica, quartz is the mineral name for silica. And when we use silica as a glaze ingredient, most of it actually is probably coming from the sandstone because that's a lot easier to crush than from stuff like this. But you could crush this stuff up. There, there are boulders that the size of an automobile up there on the mountain, um, the size of Campbell State Park. So uh, the mineral quartz was originally igneous. It was originally formed in igneous rocks. But it, when we mine it and we used it for pottery, most of it is probably coming from sedimentary sandstone. There's a sandstone out there near Berkeley Springs, which it's kind of like a sediment. The sandstone is so soft that it, the sandstone is literally falling apart back into sand. It's really cool. You stand at the edge of this cliff, and the sandstone is just, it, there's a huge sand pile at the bottom. And just the, the erosion and the weathering is turning it back into sand. So it wasn't that hard to cement, hard, you know, compactly cemented in the first place. And so the company just goes and scoops this stuff up. They don't even have to crush it practically. They just sit there, you know, if they wait long enough, it just turns back into sand. Flint, and you've probably seen this as a glaze ingredient. Flint is just, is a di I didn't bring any examples in here, but it's a, it's a different form of silica, and it's mostly British. It's mostly European, because a lot in, in Europe, they didn't have either the sand beaches like this here, or they didn't have the chunks of quartz like I'm passing around. What they had was, little chunks of silica that occurred like in the chalk cliffs of Dover was found in the limestone. So they gathered that up and used it. And that, that form of, of quartz is called flint. So that's why if you see a recipe that calls for flint, it's still silica, or it's still the mineral quartz, but that's kind of the European or the British name. So feldspar, <coughs> feldspar, that's another really common glaze ingredient, right? We have soda feldspars and potash feldspars for glaze ingredients. Um, those are basically igneous minerals again. But, and they, like that, that piece of granite I passed around, you might say, well, how do you separate out the quartz and the, and the mica? Well, you don't. But under certain conditions, you get much more concentrated areas of feldspar like this. And you get huge masses of pretty pure feldspars that they can dig up and mine and, and use that. So feldspar was another one, but it would come from a rock like a granite. And there would be areas, though, under the ground where you'd have a mine where you'd have huge masses of giant, of not, not much else but feldspar. And so they could dig that up and end up with a pretty pure product. Um, limestone and dolomite, well, there's, 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 we use both of those, we use both of those as glazing. Limestone is whiting. That's the, that's the name that we call it when we use it as a glazing. Well, whiting is limestone. And we use dolomite. And dolomite is that, exactly that, it's another kind of limestone that, that contains magnesium. And that's that other rock I passed around. So this is just sedimentary rocks. And those are fairly soft. So you, you can just dig them up, quarry, dig them up, and crush them and grind them. And you've got the, the materials that we, that we use, limestone and dolomite. And there, there's a lot of limestone. You may, I don't know whether you've ever seen it, but if you go down near Costco in Frederick, there's a huge limestone quarry right there in Frederick. Because this, when we get to it, we'll talk about it, but there are, there are bands of limestone formation that are exposed all up and down this part of the country. And they're separated by other kinds of rocks. So these sort of long, streaky areas of limestone, and the, one, the, the quarry in Frederick is sitting on one of those. The quarry right down the road here, a couple miles down the road, is sitting on dolomite. And it's another one of these long, sort of stretched out kind of 
zones of limestone, but there are a lot of them only in this part of the country. We hope you're enjoying the show. Please take a moment to leave a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice. It really helps new listeners find the show. Don't forget to subscribe to receive updates as new episodes are released. And if you'd like to support the video and podcast production of the Potter's Roundtable, become a patron. Go to patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Your support will help us achieve our goal of creating a digital library spanning the ceramic arts for use by educators and artists alike. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. Volcanic ash, we already talked about. We use pumice, volcanic ash, we talked about that already. That's, that's a glaze ingredient. I mean, you could, like, I know some people, for instance, that were making glazes from the ash from Mount St. Helens. When that erupted, you had kind of an unlimited supply of glaze ingredient. So you go shovel it off your car and put it inside and make glaze out of it. You know? uh, what's really interesting, they're finding out now, is that some of the ancient um, ash deposits, like Vesuvius, the Romans used the ash to make their concrete. And they're finding now that the, the concrete, they actually made concrete. The, the concrete that the Romans made is incredibly durable. And part of the reason why it was durable was because of the particular kind of ash they used from Mount Vesuvius to include in their concrete. And they're studying, I worked on concrete for a while also when I was in industry. And they're studying the properties of the Roman concrete because there's something really unique about the volcanic ash that they used to make it. And it made incredibly durable, incredibly durable concrete. I mean, there's still freestanding concrete arches made in the Romans around the turn, you know, two millennia ago. Um, Two of the other ingredients that we use, talc and wollastonite, those are both glaze ingredients. Those are mostly metamorphic rocks. Talc is a magnesium silicate. Wollastonite is a calcium silicate. You may remember those, those in glaze ingredients. Talc and wollastonite, those are both, those, they mine those from metamorphic rocks. So again, you might find a big, there's a big deposit I used to live near, work up in northern New York State, a huge talc deposit. And this was a big area where this, the, all the rock was pretty pure. It was mostly just talc, and they could just dig it up and get it. Two, two other materials that we have, spodumene and petalite, recognize those names for glazing reasons. Those are found in igneous rocks. So again, there might be, they, so it, it isn't just like one little grain here and one little grain there, but it, there'd be certain cases where the geological processes would tend to concentrate those minerals. So they'd find a, a deposit, a local deposit of a lot of spodumene or a lot of petalite, enough to make it worthwhile to dig it up, and they wouldn't have to do too much purification or separation to end up with the pure mineral. The borate minerals, like gersley borate and, some, and soda ash, these other things, those are mostly lake deposits. Those are, those are mostly um, materials that were deposited in, in lakes, ancient lake deposits, where the water was carried down from the higher mountains and it eroded and carried these minerals down and then deposited them in these beds. You heard also like related to that, like the salt flats, the Bonneville salt flats, same idea. These are, these are ancient deposits that were formed in ancient lakes where the minerals were carried down from the surrounding mountains by streams and rivers and deposited in these basins and left behind these thick deposits of these minerals. And finally, the things that we use as colorants, like iron, copper, nickel, and those, those sort of special materials, these are kind of really very special ore deposits that could be formed by a lot of different processes. But like when you find a copper ore, like, like when we, we use copper, there are very specific, there are different kinds, but very specific processes that could cause copper to be concentrated in one part of the earth enough to make it worthwhile digging up. There's probably copper, for example, everywhere. You could probably go in the backyard and there's a trace of copper in the soil here, but not enough to make it worthwhile to gather. But under certain geological conditions, the elements get concentrated and you find these pockets or these concentrations of elements that then you can dig up. A lot of the other materials that we use for glazes, we're not using them right out of the ground. I mean like lime winding and all these things and feldspar, they're pretty much out of the ground. But things like lithium carbonate, and magnesium carbonate, these are chemically processed. So a lot of these things are, have been chemically processed to purify from the naturally occurring materials. So I'll just read off something like lithium carbonate. That doesn't occur in any significant quantities. That's a chemical product made from a lithium mineral. So they might mine spodumene, and then in a chemical factory, they turn that into lithium carbonate, which we would buy. Or barium carbonate. Yeah, there is barium carbonate that occurs as a natural mineral, but not enough that you can just dig it up a lot. So instead, again, that's sort of a chemical product. Um, copper carbonate, a common colorant. 
you're not buying copper carbonate just dug out of the ground. They dig up the copper, they process it, and make copper carbonate out of it, and then we buy that. So it's, it's been through some processing. It's not, it's not directly out of the ground. Let's, let's talk briefly about local geological history, because this is, a lot happened around here. Um, and basically, all we're going to talk about is the results of continents colliding and separating. That's what they, we, we're gonna, there are a whole we're going to talk about it, but there are a series of continents that collided and split apart, and collided and split apart, and collided and split apart, and they're still doing it. So uh, about 1.1 billion years ago, uh, there was an ancient continent called Rodinia, or Rodinia, which was forming from previously existing continents. So the one thing to remember here is that when we talk about the continents, I'm not just talking about the part we see above the ground, you know, above the sea right now. I'm talking about the whole plate. But the part that we see, the shape of the continents we see now has changed because continents have moved together and then it's like you take two puzzle pieces and you bring them together and then you tear them apart along a different line. So now you've got new pieces. You've got maybe two pieces up here and two pieces here. You combine them again and then it tears apart again in a different way. So, there are parts of them that stayed intact, like the, cent the centers of the continents tend to the same, which makes sense, tend to stay intact. But they had pieces added on to the edges, were torn away from the edges as they collided and moved apart. So around, around 1.1 billion years ago, ancient continents that already existed collided to form a new continent called Rodinia. And when this happened, there were ancient mountains that formed, because the continents slammed together in slow motion and, and formed these mountains. And at the time, as a result of that, there was a metamorphic rock formed from old granite. This is it. This is a 1.1 billion year old rock. And I found it right over here a couple of miles away. There's, an, there's a really unusual exposure. This is, called the, this is called the Middletown Nice. It's the basement rock under this whole part of Maryland. It's the oldest rock under this whole part of Maryland. This was from this continent that was formed about 1.1 billion years ago. This may be the oldest rock you ever hold in your hand. And so there was, there was when, when the two continents, when the continents slammed together to form this new continent, Rodinia, the, the older rocks were, con, were converted, the older granite was converted into this metamorphic rock called Nice, G-N-I-S-S. -S. And the only way, I knew it was here, but I couldn't, you couldn't get at it because it was buried underground. And then I found out they were doing a road, it was really cool, they were doing a road cut over here on 180, and they were, they were widening the road, and they dug into the hillside. And when they dug into the hillside, they exposed this rock. And then about 700 million years ago, we're still talking back in this period here, 700 million years before then, the, the, the continent started to tear itself apart. And the continent, it was called rifting. The continent, you've probably heard the term before, you hear about rift valleys. A rift valley is what forms when a continent is tearing itself apart and the land kind of slumps down because you're literally creating cracks in the continent. So around 700 million years ago, this ancient continent started to tear itself apart. And when it did, volcanoes were formed and a whole portion of the land was flooded with volcanic lava. And I didn't bring it along with me, but you can find evidence of that around here, just down the road. Um, only it's been changed into a new kind of rock because of later processes, but it's an ancient lava so that's about 600 million years old. I bet you. Matter of fact, I made a glaze out of it. It's really cool. It makes a nice glaze. Um, so then, then when this when this continent was tearing itself apart, it started to form a new ocean because something you know waters around the continent. So when this when Rodinia started to rip itself apart and water came in. New, new sediments are being deposited, new things are happening underwater, but it started to actually open up and form a new ocean called the Iapetus, Iapetus Ocean, which has long since gone. Iapetus Ocean. T-U-S, Iapetus Ocean. And uh, it, formed, it started to form a narrow sea, kind of like today, the Red, the Red Sea is, a, is, a, is a, a, the, the continent, the Red Sea is actually an expanding ocean. It's kind of, a Red Sea is another example of an ocean that's happening because of, of continent spreads. So when this first formed, it formed something that kind of looks sort of like the Red Sea, this long, narrow ocean between these two separating pieces of continent. And a lot of, in that ocean, a lot of sedimentary rocks were deposited. Because, you know, if you imagine you've got mountains 
and then they're being pulled apart. Well, all the, all the streams and the rivers and are carrying all this sand and they're getting depositing into the ocean. Between, so the, the, the continents are separating, the ocean's getting wider, and all this stuff, rocks and minerals, are being deposited in the basin between the oceans. And um, that this thing here that I brought along, that's when this was deposited originally. This was deposited as sort of a shale-like material in the oceans um, when, the, when, the, when the two continents were separating. That's when this was deposited. And a lot of the other rocks around here, the rocks up here on Maryland Heights, that's when they were deposited. When these two earlier continents, they were separate, they were deposited in this ocean as these continents separated. And all these limestones around here, same thing, were deposited roughly around the same time. Um, then around, somewhere around the mid-Paleozoic, now we're getting up into this period, the ocean started closing again. The continents were shifting around, and that ocean that had opened up now started to slam closed again. And around the end of this, around, let's see, around, yeah, around, around the end of the Paleozoic, so before the beginning of that, um, North America, now it's, it started, North America basically collided, it started, it started closing again, and you had other continents that collided together. So you started, North America basically collided with Africa, and South America, and this is when these, the basically the, Adira the all the mountains up the eastern United States were formed, the ones that exist today, that remain today. When 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 the continents Africa and South America slammed into North America, and when they did, all the rocks around here got crumpled and bent and folded, and that's when this folding happened. So this was deposited in the ocean, and then later when the continents slammed together. If they, as they were opening up, this stuff was deposited, and then when they came back together and slammed together, this stuff was, fent, was bent and folded. And what's really cool around here is that, let me erase this, the mountains that we see around here, um, like Catoctin Mountain and South Mountain and, um, um, what's the other one here? Blue, the blue, actually, the mountain called Blue Ridge, these are the, remain, these are the remains of the crumpling that was done during this period when the, when the continents collided. And what actually happened here, it's, it started off with like just layers of sediment. When the continents collided, they actually made a huge fold like this in the layers of rock. They were bent and squished together. And this distance we're talking about here is like 10 miles. The, the continents was, they were pushed for miles and squashed together. And then later on, it was eroded, it was wet, worn down, and you end up with something that looks kind of like that. This is Catoctin Mountain, and that's South Mountain and Blue Ridge. So these are the these are the, the edges of this big fold that of what was left of this big fold that was crushed in when these things when the continents collided about 250 million years ago. So um, after they collided, then they, they separated again. So they had crushed together. And then that's when the Atlantic Ocean formed. So after Africa and South America, and they all collided together to produce the mountains along the eastern coast. And when they slammed together, they pushed up the mountains. And then they, and then they drifted apart again um, after about 250 million years. And that's when, that's when the present ocean opened. They separated again, and water came back in. And of course, now we give it a different name, but it's now the Atlantic Ocean. And ever since then, um, and the Atlantic Ocean is still widening. I mentioned earlier at the beginning, it is still growing wider. Pacific Ocean, excuse me, it's closing. And basically, everything that's happened since that time has basically just been erosion. All the pre-existing mountains are being worn down. Sediments are being deposited in the ocean. The Atlantic Ocean is expanding because you may have heard of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. There's a line down the middle of the Atlantic mountain chain underneath the ocean that runs all the way from Iceland all the way almost to Antarctica. And it's a line where new, new lava, new molten rock is coming up from the mantle and, and spreading and pushing the continents apart. So the, it's, it's spreading the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean the, the, is, is closing in. And cr this is why I have earthquakes in California, because the Pacific Ocean is crumpling into the coast of California. So, but, it, but basically, so what we see around here, all these ridges are the remains of this crumpling that occurred when the continents um, collided. So anyway, to summarize, so you had 
This, so all this stuff around here, the ancient continents that collided to form Rodinia, then they tore apart to form the Iapetus Ocean, then they collided again to form this new continent, which was called Pangaea, and then they opened again and formed the Atlantic Ocean. And so what we see, so the, 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 the real thing about here is you can find all the rocks from all these different stages. Like I said, I was able to find that nice, that rock from the really 1.1 billion years ago. You can find this stuff, which was deposited in the ocean and then crumpled and bent when the continents collided and formed the mountains. And then you can, and they were up, and at the same time, Frederick, the whole Frederick Valley, there's a line of geological faults along, just along this side of Catoctin Mountain. And that's another rift valley. Because when the, when, when the Atlantic Ocean started opening, the continent started to tear itself apart. And so Frederick is basically a rift valley, and there are several of them along here, where the, where the land slumped down. There's a great, another great rock I didn't bring along here, but it's where, when the, rock, when, the, when the mountains started to separate, there were limestone cliffs, and the limestone was broken off and carried down in chunks and got cemented together by iron minerals. And it looks like it's called a, a conglomerate or a breccia. And you've got chunks of one rock in another rock. And that formed when the, when the rift valley opened. Really cool. And so you have these big chunks of limestone that literally tumbled down the face and then were settled and were cemented together to form another rock. I've seen that down near Leesburg, too. There's a farm field down near Leesburg where they had a bike race. Uh -huh. and big boulders that make that conglomerate. Yeah, and, and it's around here. And matter of fact, it was actually quarried. It's used, I think, in the Capitol building. It was actually quarried at one time. It's called the Calico Marble. Uh -huh. It's not marble at all, but it was called the calico marble. And it's beautiful because it has like grayish white chunks, angular chunks, in a pinkish red background. Um, and it was mine. And I think there's, there's some build, there's some columns and I think the Capitol building or the State Building or something that were quarried and, and used for it. What about the Appalachian Mountains and then the that's, Is that, that the day that's all the same, that's all the same time from the collision, up and down. And if you notice, that's why, again, if you look at the map, all these mountains in the eastern part of the United States parallel the coastline. Yeah. Now that wasn't originally the coastline. Uh, the coastline, a long time ago, was probably only about a little bit east of Frederick, what was originally the coast. Uh, but yeah, that's why they're all, they basically, because that's where the continent slammed in. We know that this was a lot of information in a short period of time, so if you want to hear it again, listen to our podcast version of the presentation. Search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. Okay, so that brings us up to date. And that's about it. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, well thank you all for coming. If you'd like to support our educational outreach efforts, go to patreon.com and consider becoming a, a patron and search for the Potter's Roundtable on the Patreon site. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website, at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.